Good evening. Uh, my name is Rod Fleck. I'm the president of the Augustan Society. So just give me one second while I pull that up and share my screen so you can kind of see a little bit about who we are. Um, and the uh, society's been around since the 1950s and it has an interest in um, genealogy, heraldry, chivalry, history, archaeology, and related topics up until about the, I'll say the 1700 period, though there are colonial genealogists and different groups in the genealogy groups that are much more modern. <clears throat> one of the things the society was known for at one time was involving academics in its research and in a, public, a series of publications it did for decades. And then as the society of predominantly elderly people got older and people migrated to computers, there was a disconnect. And the society membership is smaller, but if this is of interest to you, you know, contact us about that and we'll, let, we'll keep, fill you in. A couple folks on tonight are members and um, appreciate them attending as well. And the idea came about as a conversation with Pat Lowinger, who's here, about how could we use platforms to share information. Uh, we have done that on some other things. He and I working together with a couple others, I think that are on here. Uh, long distance conversations and sharing information. And <clears throat> we were like, well, let's, you know, let's use this opportunity to uh, reach out to some uh, emerging academics and, and have them share their field with us and something that they enjoy that brings them excitement. And I will say I've learned things about whales. I've learned things about Magna Mata. I've learned things about the urban cohort, which have been fascinating to me. I'm in Forks, Washington. So uh, you know, that's at the end of the world or pretty close. We can see it on a good day from a hilltop. And people like this, having the ability to share information is just amazing. We're pretty fortunate tonight. Uh, Jonathan Query, JQ, is, uh, his interactions go back and forth. Uh, fourth year PhD candidate. And the rumor is, I was told in November, becomes the right honorable doctor, Query. Um, in the Department of Archaeology at Durham University. And his interests are on Ro Romano native art and architecture in provincial and frontier settings and Roman military and contact zones. Uh, his postgraduate research focuses on placing, uh, placemaking effects of the Roman military tropea, I hope I did that right, which sure. political military leaders of the Republican and Imperial periods constructed in provincial and frontier environments, allowing uh, following uh, marital and martial engagements. Uh, he received his BA in history and ancient Mediterranean studies from the College of Worcester with honors and his MA in ancient Greek and Roman studies from Brandeis University with high honors. He's also the assistant director and field supervisor of, uh, at the archaeology at Halmaris excavation in Romania, as well as a field director at the Crocodilian archaeological excavation in Israel. So with that, I'm going to just turn this over to Jonathan so he can quickly correct what I got wrong in pronunciation. And uh, we'll let him take over the screen. And uh, I think, Jonathan, you should be able, should be able to share the screen. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think I did that right. I'll stop that. Yep. Um, so can Great. everyone see that shared screen just real quick? Thumbs up, maybe? Yep. Yeah? OK. Um, well, before I begin the presentation today, I just wanted to take a moment um, and thank the Augustan Society for having me here today, um, and especially Rod Fleck, um, who I've been in communication with um, over the past few months um, leading up to the presentation, um, and also everyone who is in attendance today and came out to listen. Uh, so the information that I'm going to be presenting today derives from my postgraduate research here at Durham University, um, of which uh, Rod just summarized um, my research interest. Um, so my research examines the placemaking effects of Roman military trophies within provincial and frontier environments. To do so, I assess the available archeological and literary evidence um, related to such monuments, as well as the geographic position and other pre-existing or contemporaneously built structures. The premise of my research contends that military trophies engaged with their environments 
and facilitated Roman politico military leaders of the late Republican and early imperial periods in the creation or reorganization of provincial and frontier places. Um, beyond this simple military commemoration that is inherent within these monuments already. So the two monuments that we're going to be looking today are two of seven um, that are a part of the corpus of which I'm looking at for my PhD research. Um, the first monument and the earliest is the one pictured here on the left, the Nicopolis Tropeum. Um, most of the images that you will see today of the Nicopolis Tropeum are illustrations um, like the one you see here. The archaeological evidence is much more lacking and not as well displayed as the Tropeum Alpium, which you see on the right. Uh, so both of these monuments are Augustan in date and date to the late first century BCE, very early on um, in the reign of Augustus. The Nicopolis Tropeum and the Tropeum Alpium are two examples of these monuments. Um, and they date to the latter portion of such practices within the wider ancient Mediterranean world. Um, only the Tropeum Traiani that the Emperor Trajan constructed um, in Moesia Inferior following the Dacian Wars uh, in the early second century CE post-date these Augustan examples, after which ancient peoples resigned such monuments to iconography on secondary media, such as coinage, statues, statuettes, oil lamps, sarcophagi, um, among others. Um, before we dive into looking at the monuments, uh, these Augustan monuments here, I want to take a moment to sort of set the stage, if you will. Um, we're first going to look at what is an ancient military trophy? The Augustan monuments that we'll eventually look at um, in, in, a, in a brief moment are, as I said, two of the latest examples in a long history, nearly 500 years of ancient military trophy construction. Um, and as such, they assume a very monumental form. This is not how ancient military trophies originally came about, and it's important to understand some of the history before just diving into these Augustan examples. So the ancient military trophy, it's a unique archetype that emerges from the Persian Wars of the first half of the fifth century BCE as a means for Greek political military leaders to commemorate victorious battles against the quote unquote barbarian other. These monuments often consisted of a mannequin composed of arms and armor, which the victorious army built on the battlefield. Um, so you can see in this very, very dramatic illustration, um, which I got from an ancient warfare magazine, an example of a temporary military trophy that the ancient Greeks may have constructed on the battlefield during the fifth century BCE. And as you've seen with the previous, um, the previous slide and the images of uh, the Augustan monuments, this is much different than what we'll see in the late Republican and early imperial periods. So the ancient Greek tropeion derived from the, the Greek word trepo, which literally means to turn, as such monuments initially marked the point on a battlefield at which one phalanx or line of soldiers successfully routed or turned the other. The ancient Greeks additionally considered tropea to be sacrosanct monuments with which others should not tamper. Now, when I say tamper, this could mean either the repair of monuments or the destruction of monuments, depending on potentially what side of the battle or what side of the ideology you may, you may find yourself. The ancient Greeks regularly replaced these temporary monuments with more permanent structures um, sometime after the engagement. Uh, the most well-known permanent tropea from the classical period include those from the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, 
the battles of Salamis and Sipsalia in 480 BC, and then again at Leuctra in 379 BCE. Those are a few of hundreds of temporary and permanent examples that once existed in the classical ancient Greek world, however. The archetype quickly entered into the wider visual vocabulary of not only the ancient Greek world, but other Mediterranean cultures, which interestingly enough in this discussion from the fifth century classical period through to the late first century BCE and early first century CE of the Roman period did not include the Macedonians during the height of their hegemony of the second half of the third century BCE. The Macedonians had uniquely different um, monuments and structures which they commissioned um, to celebrate their own military victories. The Romans appear to adopt the military trophy archetype in the late third century BCE as Roman controlled territories began to expand rapidly beyond peninsular Italy. Knowledge of such customs, however, was likely more long, long standing. The earliest reference to a Roman tropaeum comes from a literary passage of Lucius Florus in his accounts of Roman history. Um, and he credits the consul Gaius Flaminius, who was consul in 223 as well as 217 BCE, um, for erecting such a monument after he defeated the Gallic and Subres in the year of his first consulship. This reference is difficult to validate though without archeological evidence um, and likely falls somewhere between historical half-truth and literary anachronism. The earliest tangible Roman use of a military trophy archetype within the archeological record comes from the Victoriatus coinage, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here. Rome began to mint the Victoriatus coinage in the middle of the Second Punic War, um, following the siege of Syracuse in 212 BCE. Now, looking at the coin just very briefly, we can see on the left-hand side, we have an image of Nike, a deity of victory itself, constructing a temporary tropaeum, similar to the one that we saw in the illustration in the previous slide. Roman political military leaders used tropaea throughout the late Republican and early imperial periods as a means firstly to foster Roman imperialistic ideologies within provincial and frontier places, as well as secondly, to promote one's own position in the increasingly competitive environment of the late Republican period. One more thing to address before we take a look at the Augustan monuments um, is a cornerstone to my research, which is placemaking theory. So placemaking theory, as the name itself distinguishes, is the method in which human actors physically make place. So placemaking focuses on how people craft the world that they inhabit um, and to which they ascribe meaning through experience. In other words, this is how people relate to the places that they occupy and how their activities inform the relationship between the peoples and the places themselves. Placemaking underpins that human behavior are both experiential as well as habitual. And such practices, practices actively make place so that people can understand the places as the constructed and production of individuals, families, social groups, or entire societies. These places then in turn influence the practices and social relations so that they are never completely made, but are in a constant state of reworking. The field of archeology span is closely connected to the study of space and place both. And, such, and as such, settlements, monuments, 
other human-made structures that occupied specific geographic regions um, inherit, uh, well, interacted with their spatial environments. Placemaking in the Roman world was shaped by different human experiences and practices, which could either be very localized, as we'll see more so with the Nicopolis Tropeum, or at the imperial level, as we'll see more so with the Tropeum Ulpium. Um, and it acknowledges that places create meaning that extend beyond the immediate spatial boundaries. Placemaking in the Roman world was also fundamentally connected with how ancient peoples perceive the world and how their daily political, religious, social, and economic activities all contributed to how places were fashioned and made significant for and by human actors. And in each act of placemaking, a constant negotiation or renegotiation between behaviors, beliefs, and values influence the manner in which places were made, sustained, and transformed over time. So with a little bit of that backing um, behind us, let us take a look at the first monument and the earliest example of these Augustan military trophies, um, this being the Nicopolis Tropeum. So the Nicopolis Tropeum was commissioned by Octavian, who I will periodically refer to as the Emperor Augustus hereafter. Um, but for the sake of the time period, I'm going to try and refer to him as Octavian, as this is who he was identified as um, between 31 and 27 during the battle and during the foundation of Nicopolis, as well as the Tropeum itself. Um, Please note that Octavian and the Emperor Augustus are the same people, um, and he goes by a different name following 27 BCE after the Senate grants him the name Augustus. So Octavian commissioned the Nicopolis Tropeum shortly after the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE to commemorate his naval victory against Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Now, the Battle of Actium effectively ended the civil turmoil of the Republican period, which lasted for about the last half century of the first century BCE. And this victory positioned Augustus to become the first emperor of the imperial period thereafter, as I mentioned, the Emperor Augustus. Um, so here on... The uh, right-hand side of the screen, you can see just a brief map, um, if I can maybe pull up a laser pointer here. Um, so just to highlight a few things on the map very quickly, what we're looking at here is the area around Actium in which the battle itself took place. Um, the forces of Octavian were positioned in the far west, those of uh, Mark Antony were positioned farther east with those of Cleopatra behind. But what I want to point out more importantly is up here where it says the campsite memorial. Um, this itself eventually becomes the place at which Octavian commissions his first military trophy. You can see that the trophy itself sits on the high point in this peninsula. Um, with the city of Nicopolis down in the low-lying area. Actium itself is actually on the southern peninsula here in the south, leading from the Ionian Sea into the Gulf of Umbrakia. So the architectural and artistic design of the Nicopolis Tropeum differed notably from other such monuments um, from the Roman world because it commemorated a naval engagement. Um, and it's the only extant Roman military trophy to do so, at least that historians and archeologists are aware of to date. Um, as we can see in the image in the top left corner here, the lower tier displayed an epigraphic inscription above an assemblage of rostra or naval rams, 
um, that were collected from the defeated navy of Mark Antony himself. The, dedic the dedicatory inscription read in translation, Imperator Kaiser, son of the divine Julius, following the victory and the war which he waged on behalf of the Republic in this region, when he was consul for the fifth time and Imperator for the seventh time, after peace had been secured on land and sea, consecrated to Neptune and Mars, the camp from which he set forth to attack the enemy, now ornamented with naval spoils. Um, so just to reiterate, this monument does not have many, um, many remains that are visible today. So if we take a look here on the right-hand side of the screen, we can see a portion of the reconstructed um, inscription above the display of naval rams here. Looking again at the top left corner here, um, the display of naval rams and the inscription would have been here. Um, 36 naval rams in total have been, um, or at least the sockets for, have been discovered to date. There is one naval ram that has been discovered on site, which is a pretty fascinating find um, within the archeological record. Um, <clears throat> So the Nicopolis Tropaeum was built on a tiered terrace at the high point in the landscape. And if we look at this image again, we can see that the upper tier now um, contained this pie-shaped stoa, um, as in the ancient Greek pie letter, um, uh, with a decorative altar in the center. Now this illustration leaves out the decorative altar. If I back up just briefly, you can see more clearly in this illustration here, this large monumental altar, which is placed in the middle of the stoa itself. Um, once again, we have some illustrations. This is uh, a more up close look of the altar itself. Um, on the top panel, um, we can see what is clearly a procession of various dignitaries, ambassadors, Roman senators, Roman soldiers, the emperor himself, um, but the most important part of this upper frieze probably lies within the first three panels here before the procession itself. If we look, we can see here in the second panel um, a rendition of a ship, certainly not an actual naval ship. As you can see, it has little wheels on the bottom of it. This is clearly meant to be in the procession itself, um, followed by people who are leading an ox, a sheep, and a pig. Um, this is a very, very common uh, iconographic image that is displayed within victory reliefs. Um, this sacrifice of these three animals in the Roman world is known as a suaway tarrelia um, and often marked the beginning as well as the end of military campaigns. So this top relief, we, we have a clear religious um, ceremony um, either commemorating the end, but most likely to be, or, sorry, the beginning, but most likely the end of um, the civil wars of the Republican period. The lower panel, um, which looks just like a jumble of things, is again often represented in victory iconography. We see here collections of arms and armor piled up, um, interspersed between we have here as well as here, some over here, um, the naval rams that were displayed on the front of the monument itself. So again, linking this back as a trophy monument um, commemorating the Battle of Actium itself. So the Nicopolis Tropaeum was likely one of the earliest constructed monuments following the Battle of Actium in what was previously, and I'll describe as an uninhabited landscape. And it ultimately facilitated the Emperor Augustus in the reorganization of this region of Epirus, um, being this northwestern part of Greece here. In other words, the military trophy had significant placemaking effects within the area, both during and after the Augustan period. 
the Nicopolis Tropaeum initially created, as Pierre Nora coined in a discussion elsewhere, Les Lus de Memoir, a site of memory or a memory scape. Octavian commissioned the monument on the location of his military camp from where he watched the Battle of Actium and in so doing created a new place which had significant meaning, not only for him or for his armies, but also by extension for the Julio-Claudian imperial family and the expanding ideologies of the Roman Empire thereafter. Octavian reinforced this newly established memory scape and founded the city of Nicopolis itself, secondary to the trophy, I would like to add, which in ancient Greek literally translates to the city of victory. Nike being the goddess of victory, Polis being an ancient city-state within the Greek world. Octavian reorganized the pre-existing ancient Greek landscape and forcibly relocated the native peoples of Epirus, Acarnania, and Aetolia to repopulate Nicopolis itself, which became the provincial capital for Epirus Wetis from 29 BCE onwards. So if we take a brief look at the map that's here on the right-hand side of the screen, we can see Nicopolis highlighted here um, with the various regions pre-established by the ancient Greeks. Um, this is from Susan Alcock's book on um, Captagrykia, um, and she does a very nice job of showing where the forcible relocations and just how far some of these people were relocated to settle Augustus's city of victory. Um, it's interesting to note that also down here, we see a similar reorganization of the northwest part of Ikea itself, where Patria also became a new provincial capital for this region of Greece um, across the little inlet here, again, forcibly relocating some of the local populations into a new established Roman city center. So Octavian additionally established or reestablished the religious festival to Apollo Actios in 27 BCE, but henceforth in memory of his own victory against Mark Antony and Cleopatra rather than Apollo himself. Certainly there was some reverence paid to Apollo, but there's also reverence being paid to the achievements of Augustus himself. The Actia, or Actian Games, eventually received a sacred, um, the, uh, the sacred title of Agon, or a religious festival within the ancient Greek world. Um, to compare, that would, put it, that would put the Actian Games on par with the ancient Olympic Games, for example, or the ancient Delphic Games. This is a pretty monumental um, title to be given. Um, so the Romans hosted the Actian Games every five years from 27 BCE through to the mid-3rd century CE with various athletic games such as racing, horse racing, wrestling, as well as musical contests. But most importantly and most notably, there were displays or presentations of naumachia or mock naval battles. Now the relation between the Battle of Actium, the veneration being paid to Augustus, and the mock naval battles that would have been performed during the Actian Games is fairly obvious. These religious activities were performed in the Proastion of Nicopolis, or the Sacred Grove, located just beyond the limits of Nicopolis itself. Um, the Tropaeum, held the most prominent position within this sacred part of the city. The Nicopolis Tropaeum therefore not only venerated Octavian's military success, but also created a sacred space through which ancient peoples performed 
quinquennial religious festivals that reflected back upon the significance of the naval engagement and more importantly, the achievements that the Emperor Augustus brought to the Roman world through to the Christian period. The Actian Games guaranteed participatory as well as performative qualities within Nicopolis and the tropeum, stadium, gymnasium, and theater all held significant functions. No other ancient military trophy required as much, as, as much engagement as the trophy at Nicopolis. The performance was one of the most fundamental components in the creation of place at Nicopolis. The ritual activities performed here and at the Nicopolis Tropeum, as well as the other structures that I just mentioned, was the nexus through which people interacted with their environment. And these practices focused the attention upon the place itself and the significance that that place held within the Greco-Roman world. The experience of such ritual activities would have had different effects per person based off of a variety of factors, such as their level of participation within the festivities, their civic or social standing, their age, most likely their gender, among many other features. The meanings connected to the built environment and to the surrounding landscape enliven the experiences of Nicopolis itself. And through such physical engagement with the place, new meanings and memories could be created while still retaining pre-existing remembrances for the Emperor Augustus. The Nicopolis Tropeum and the Actian Games each had commemorative purposes in order to prevent memorial decay throughout the imperial period. The memory of the Emperor Augustus was deeply rooted in this place through the allusions to prior authority. Um, I guess before we move on, just very quickly, um, here, just to point out what I have on the right-hand side, um, this is an oil lamp that's at um, the local museum in Preveza, Greece. Um, here we see a table um, with a little uh, juglet vase underneath, but most importantly, what we have here is a victory wreath being laid upon the table. Um, this is one of many objects that would have been used during the, uh, the religious uh, festivities of the Actian Games, um, and a number of uh, lamps, oil lamps similar to this, have been found throughout the archaeological record at Nicopolis. Um, so here we're going to take a little bit of a shift. We're going to move to a different part of the empire um, and about 20 years after the founding of Nicopolis and the commissioning of the Tropeum at Nicopolis. So here what we are looking at uh, is the Tropeum Alpium. So the Roman Senate and people, at least according to the dedicatory inscription on the monument itself, dedicated the Tropeum Alpium, or the Trophy of the Alps, to the Emperor Augustus somewhere between 7 and 6 BCE in the Alps Maritimi to commemorate the Roman victories against 44 native Alpine peoples. The Tropeum Alpium was the second monumental trophy the Romans erected in a provincial landscape during the Augustan period. Um, to memorialize these military engagements. Um, the Nicopolis Tropeum only predated this monument by approximately 20 years, um, after which there are very, very few archaeological remains to attest for other Augustan military trophies during his reign. The Emperor Augustus refocused military attention following the civil wars of the late Republican period and organized campaigns to subdue the Alps. This mountain range, <clears throat> excuse me, this mountain range had previously provided Rome a certain degree of security from northern invasions 
the incursions of Brennus in 329 and that of Hannibal Barca during the Second Punic War are two very notable exceptions to this. Um, the Alps eventually proved to be a, a problematic region for the Romans, however, as Roman influence began to extend beyond peninsular Italy and into mainland Europe. The Roman Senate focused little effort to incorporate these territories into the imperial framework prior to the Augustan Alpine Wars um, of the late first century BCE. The Emperor Augustus, however, intended to conduct military campaigns beyond the Rhine as well as the Danube and realized that in order to do so, securing the Alps was essential as well as other independent parts of Gaul in Western Europe. Um, Sophie Binninger, in a discussion on the Alpine Wars, very states very well that the campaigns in the Alps were pacification, quote, pacification operations in a region that in theory was already subjected to the empire. The accounts of the Alpine Wars are minimal and, and the only reference uh, to the conflict were recorded in the later 2nd and 3rd century CE texts of, of Tacitus, Tacitus and Cassius Dio. These authors do not present the war as a major offensive, but rather as a series of small or minor skirmishes in different parts of Gallia Cisalpina and Gallia Transalpina and even as far north as Germ uh, Germania Superior. The first in 25 BCE, and the subsequent three in 16, 15, and 14 BCE seem to mark the major years of these, offensive, uh, of these offenses. The Emperor Augustus, as previously witnessed at the Battle of Actium, did not command the Roman troops himself, but rather appointed three military commanders to do so. Polybius Silius, Tiberius Claudius Nero, and Nero Claudius Drusus. The inclusion of both Tiberius and Drusus as military leaders support the notion that Augustus, and that it was Augustus, that brought peace and security to the Roman world as each of these individuals was a member of the imperial household. Polybius Silius engaged the peoples in the territories west of Tridentum in northern Italy, um, while Tiberius fought others along the Rhine north of the Alps, and Drusus battled others still in the Rhytian lands south of the Danube River in the eastern Alps. Now, I should, I should mention here that Unlike the Nicopolis Tropaeum that we, we just took a look at, which commemorated a singular battle, a single moment in history at a single location, the Tropaeum Alpium takes a drastic shift away from this, this previous practice and rather commemorates sporadic campaigns that are lumped together as a war that cover a vast geographical region, some 1,200 plus kilometers across the entire extent of the Alps, both north and south of it. Uh, so the architectural design of the Tropaeum Alpium, <clears throat> excuse me, the Tropaeum Alpium is also quite unique um, and again vastly different from that of the Tropaeum at Nicopolis. The Romans seem to have constructed the monument in a style similar to Eastern Hellenistic tombs. And it was the first Roman military tropea to do so. The Tropaeum Traiani in the early second century CE continues with such a tradition before the practice of trophy construction um, wanes within the Greco-Roman worlds. The Tropaeum Ulpium was 
constructed in three tiers, as we can see in the recreation um, or the model here on the right-hand side of the screen. The first and lowest tier was square-shaped um, and contained here on this side, um, an epigraphic inscription flanked by two reliefs of military trophies. Now the dedication on this military or on this military trophy, and it is obviously very difficult to read here, but we can see once again the um, inscription flanked by two military trophies on either side. The, dedic the dedicatory inscription read, dedicated to the Emperor Caesar Augustus, son of the deified Julius Caesar, Pontifex Maximus, Imperator for the 14th year, in the 17th year of his tribunician power, the Senate and Roman people commemorated this, that under his leadership and auspices, all the Alpine peoples from the upper and lower seas were submitted to the Imperium of the Roman people after which the monument includes a list of the 44 Alpine groups that the Romans subjugated during the late first century BCE. Looking at this once more, um, the second and middle um, <clears throat> tier contained this circular colonnade that likely once displayed images of the imperial family itself. And if you can see through these columns, you can actually see in this, uh, in this model, that's exactly what they decided to portray. Um, especially, most likely, that of Tiberius and Drusus. Um, a portrait believed to be of Drusus, which is now in the Archaeological Museum in Copenhagen, um, is the only statuary discovered on site and within the archaeological record um, at the Tropaeum Alpium, which suggests a potential connection between this monument and the military commander. Um, now, Drusus died during the Alpine Wars while tra traveling from the Elbe River back into Roman-controlled territories across the Rhine a death that was previously foretold in numerous omens, at least according to some of the um, ancient literary accounts. The third and final tier, which I will consider everything above the circular colonnade, um, was a conical roof atop which most scholars have theorized a statue of the Emperor Augustus himself. This is fitting for the Augustan personality he liked to put up images of himself across the empire, um, particularly um, in monuments commemorating Roman imperialism or Roman military success. However, without the, without the evidence of such a structure, um, another possibility could be the display of a military trophy itself, um, an example of which comes from the Tropaeum Traiani of the early second century CE, which includes a image of a mannequin of arms and armor. So on top here, we can either think as they have put the Emperor Augustus, the most likely possibility, or a mannequin display of arms and armor. Um, <clears throat> so before moving on very quickly, we can see um, here uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, we have two extremely fragmented um, renditions um, or images of tropaeum iconography. We can see a tree on each which holds the mannequin of arms and armor, um, as commonly seen on other secondary media. We have one male and one female who are, and you can see here, physically chained to the tree itself. Um, so this is one of the first examples, at least that we can attest within the literary or within the archaeological record, um, that actually brings about gendered spaces um, as it as it as it displays both a man and a woman. Um, this is only ever repeated again on the Tropaeum Traiani hereafter. 
So as I mentioned, the Tropeum Albium took on a funerary aspect with its architectural design. The first Roman military trophy to do so, which is quite unique because it takes a noticeable shift away from other, um, other monuments of this type. So the funerary features displayed within the Tropeum Albium marked a notable, notable, excuse me, noticeable shift away from the previously established ancient military trophies and may reflect upon the death of Drusus itself. The location of the Tropeum Alpium along the Via Julia Augusta, which we'll talk a little bit more in depth about um, shortly, further supports the idea that the monument embodied funerary characteristics because tombs often line the roads into or from towns throughout antiquity. Um, so once again, thinking back to the Nicopolis Tropeum, which while not situated within the city walls, was an integral part of the urban center itself. The Tropeum Alpium, however, is situated in the rural landscape of the Roman world, not near a new or pre-existing um, city. There is a contemporaneously built monument known as the Lumwani Mausoleum that is located a short distance from the Tropeum Alpium along the Via Julia Augusta, which further indicates that a similar practice may have occurred as far as funerary rites are concerned to some degree within this portion of the Roman world in the Ligurian Alps um, <clears throat> to the west of Northern Italy. Um, <clears throat> so what I have here is just an example. This, this monument here on the left is known as the Mausoleum of the Julii. It's located in Glanum, which is in um, modern day Southern France. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that the Tropeum Alpium embody these funerary features which are reminiscent of um, Hellenistic funerary tombs of the 4th century, uh, 4th and 2nd century BCE. Um, this monument I selected is not Hellenistic in date, but still follows that architectural style. The reason that I chose this is for two reasons. It's contemporaneously built um, construction to the Tropeum Alpium itself, um, as well as its proximity to the monument. They're both relatively close to each other, all things considered. So if we look um, just side by side, we can see, once again, we have a square base. This is, again, square, but you can see the, the, the pseudo colonnade that the monument is trying to reflect. Up here, we definitely have a colonnaded thing, which originally would have had um, a conical roof on top. Other examples of this kind of architectural style are found in examples of the Mausoleum of Helicarnassus, the Augustan Mausoleum um, itself, as well as other monuments that post-date the Augustan period, like the Mausoleum of Hadrian in the middle of the second century CE. So the Alpine Wars encompassed an, an enormous geographical region um, and the native peoples who inhabited these areas. Yet the Romans constructed the Tropeum Alpium in the Alps Maritimi, which during the Roman period functioned as a liminal space or a liminal region that connected two larger, more prominent provinces within the empire, Italy to the east and Gallia Narbonensis to the west, or I should say the Gallic provinces in general. The rural space of the Roman world were provoking context to explore the placemaking effects of Tropea because of a complex interaction between the human-made features and the natural landscape itself. Um, so the Romans appear to have selected the location not based on the military engagements, as this region was rather conflict-free conflict-free during the Alpine Wars. The position of the Tropeum Alpium therefore raises questions in regards to the Romans' decision to build the monument where they did. Why did the Romans erect a monument on this site in the Ligurian Alps? And what message did, messages 
did the monument convey within its environment. The Romans constructed the Tropaeum Alpium on the outcrop of the Alpus Sumus, the high point of the Alps as it descends in the western part of the range here as the mountains approach the sea. So in this passage, and if we trace the Alpine mountains here, in this region of the Roman world, uh, the mountains and the sea itself create Le Lou de Passage, a site of passage which forced people to follow a specific route between Northern Italy and the Gallic provinces. The architecture and the, top the topography in this, in this region created a dialogue of power at the site. The landscape was no, lo was no longer an inanimate background upon which human activity unfolded, but here was an active participant and social actor between the monument and the landscape. The Tropaeum Alpium ultimately reorganized this region of the Alps during the Augustan period, as this territory not only granted access to and from Italy and Gallia Narbonensis, but also marked geogra or geopolitical boundaries within the Roman world. At this site, Ligurian met Greek, Cisalpina met Transalpina, the Alps Maritima met Italy as well as Gallia Narbonensis. So the physical features of the landscape were not boundaries themselves. Instead, boundaries were indicated, as Ingold puts, quote, in relation to the activities of the people themselves for whom it is recognized and experienced as such. So the Emperor Augustus also constructed the Via Julia Augusta, um, the, the Augustan way, if you will, um, contemporaneously to the Tropaeum Alpium which again connected Northern Italy, a placentia, to Aralate here in Gallia Narbonensis, through the Ligurian Alps and passing the Tropaeum Alpium in route. So the Tropaeum Alpium occupied almost the halfway point between these two places before the Via Julia Augusta eventually meets up with the Via Domitia to continue around the Gallic coast before crossing the Pyrenees, where coincidentally enough, we have the Trophy of Pompey that was built some 30 odd years before the Augustan monuments um, and ending just beyond the Pyrenees. The Via Julia Augusta passed along the western side, the, the western facade of the monument, and the western side of the monument is the one that contained the dedicatory inscription as well as the two images of the trophies. So the, the monument and the road were engaging with one another. The Via Julia Augusta, like other roads throughout the empire, was an integral element to disseminate Roman imperial power and the relationship between the Tropaeum Alpium and the roadway should not be overlooked in this context here. If we think for a second how ancient peoples may have traveled, unlike the trophy at Nicopolis, which had intrinsic features associated with the urban center, the Tropaeum at Nicopolis behaves more as what I have started to coin an itinerant trophy. This is a trophy in a rural landscape connected with a road. It is not the only Roman trophy to do so. In fact, many trophies both before and after the Augustan examples follow this model. And if you hypothetically as an audience were traveling from Northern Italy to Gallia Narbonensis, the Tropaeum Alpium would have held numerous features within the landscape. If I were explaining to Pat, as I can see he's top on my list there, 
Pat is going to travel to Gallia Narbonensis from Italy. I may say to Pat, you need to head from Placentia through the coastline, passing X, Y, and Z monument, of which the Tropaeum Alpium would be one of these structures. Ancient peoples often considered journeys such as this from point A to point B as linear progressions that were defined by significant geographic or human-made features. This is how ancient peoples understood the world in which they lived and moved about the world in which they lived. More so than that, however, as just an itinerant marker along the Via Julia Augusta, the Tropaeum Alpium also marks the boundary or close to the boundary between the provinces of Italy and Gallia Narbonensis. Now this is seen also in the Trophy of Pompey from 71 BC, as well as the Tropaeum Traiani of 109 CE. Now it's interesting that such structures get placed on provincial boundaries. Um, and I would argue that the itinerant and religious features of such monuments when coupled with Roman superstition of the world in which they lived also held apotropaic characteristics for a traveler, for a Roman army or for an individual moving between provinces. The Romans perceived the world as civilized and uncivilized, safe and unsafe, cultured barbarian, Greek, Roman, and barbarian. So these monuments that sit within provincial boundaries may also have had a feature in which a, a traveler could have uh, sought safe passage as they move from Italy into a previously non-Roman but now Roman landscape. This becomes most prominent in the culmination with the Tropaeum Triani thereafter um, as the Dacians, unlike southern Gaul here, which becomes very Roman um, throughout the imperial period, but the Tropaeum Triani borders a group of peoples who were very, very difficult for the Romans to deal with. So there is something to be said about at least during the construction of these monuments, certain religious and apotropaic features that they might have held. So I would just like to finish today um, first by looking at the two images that I have here. Now we have examined two of many examples of um, ancient Greco-Roman military trophies, um, but I like this comparison next to each other. Um, on the left-hand side, we have an ancient Athenian two-handled peleke um, from the mid-5th century BCE. As we saw with the Roman Victoriatus coinage, we have Nike finishing the construction of a temporary military trophy. This peleke provides the earliest archaeological evidence for a military trophy within the ancient Mediterranean world. On the right-hand side, we have the Tropaeum Traiani of 109 CE. Um, and here you can see the monumentality that these structures eventually, um, these structures eventually have. Um, we saw the, the monumentality with the Augustan examples, which eventually culminates here with the Tropaeum Traiani. Um, I made mention to the display of arms and armor on top of the Tropaeum Traiani. Something similar to this may also be envisioned on top of the Tropaeum Alpium itself. Um, so before I conclude and take any questions uh, that the audience may have, I do want to once again thank um, a number of people who usually get a shout out in my presentations. Um, first, again, I would like to thank the Augustan Society for having me here today. It's been a pleasure to talk about my research with you all. Um, Constructing this presentation has also been very useful um, for, my, for my own research and the way that I, I form um, my own chapters. 
Um, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Richard Hingley and Dr. Catherine Draycott, who are my PhD advisors and who have been instrumental in helping me um, navigate placemaking in regards to these Roman military trophies. Um, also, I would like to thank Professor Ann Koloski Ostro, Professor Cheryl Walker, and Professor Monica Florence, who were my MA and undergraduate thesis advisors. Um, I began my research into Roman military trophies um, as an MA student with Ann Koloski Ostro and um, Cheryl Walker. Um, Monica Florence has had a huge impact um, on my decision to pursue history, classics, and classical archaeology. Um, a shout out to some of my Halmiris colleagues and some of the people who I consider to be very close friends of mine. Dr. John Caravas, probably for the first time, Dr. Nathaniel Durant, um, Pat Lowinger, Rob Caudill, James Martin, Matthew Provito, and Catherine Livingston. Um, and finally, and maybe the most important of all of them, I would like to thank um, my parents, Dr. Albert Keery and Donna Keery. Um, who have shown enormous support in my very, very long pursuit of um, academic archaeology. Um, your support has been immense, and I am I, 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 I'm at a loss for words for how thankful I am um, to, to have you both um, in my corner as I pursue this. Um, so with that, I will uh, gladly take any questions that people may have. So oh, folks, uh, go ahead and, and mute yourself if you have a question and go ahead and ask Jonathan. Jonathan, great job. I, I'll start one off with you. Sure. Um, for a lot of folks who are associated with military engagements, veterans, descendants, et cetera, do we have travel record of folks traveling to the monuments in that type of interaction? So no. Um, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, one of the things that um, originally interested me in Roman military trophies is, let's see if I can stop sharing real quick and then I'll be able to do, there we go. Um, one of the things that uh, originally interested me in um, Roman military trophies was the, the, the lack of engagement that they have received both in the ancient world as well as within modern scholarship. Um, so oftentimes within the literary sources, the, the trophies, if they are mentioned at all, are usually extremely brief. There are very, very few descriptions of these monuments. So most of our understanding as historians and as archaeologists comes from the literary record itself. Um, so a lot of the things which I'm discussing as far as the way people may have engaged with these monuments is coming from a phenomenological theory um, point of view. Um, now, there are other geographic and arch architectural features of these monuments, which I could have broken down in more detail, um, which illustrate that these monuments may have had itinerant, apotropaic, or religious features, um, but just for the scope of this presentation here, um, I, I, I just limited it to, to what we discussed today. Pat, you're, you're muted, bud. <laughs> I have a question. Um, in light yeah. of the establishment of formal, formal uh, dedications attributed to the imperial cult, the formation of religion that's defined in the imperial period, I'm curious as to how the monumentation at Neop uh, Neopolis, I always have problems saying that, uh, uh, is how does that link to this formal establishment of imperial cultic religious beliefs with the establishment of formal processions um, during festival activities which we associated with the annual, uh, the every five year games. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that may have been a liminal point of genesis for establishment of the imperial cult? Because this is the first formal dedication that I'm aware of 
with um, games in honor of Augustus himself. Or, sorry, in... Uh, that's, that, that's, that's a great question, um, and leave it to you to throw me the religion question again. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's a great question. And so while I have found no direct connection between the trophy at Nicopolis itself and the imperial cult that then follows thereafter, um, there is likely, there is likely a, at least a loose connection. The imperial cult is definitely found at Nicopolis, just not directly connected to the trophy or the sacred space itself. All, all temples to the imperial cult or all, or all statuary or iconography related to the imperial cult at Nicopolis is found, um, to, the, to my knowledge, within the city center itself. So my question would be, is, can through either archaeological or literary records be able to establish cultic activities that originate in the city that mm -hmm. then terminate during festival activities at the site, then maybe possibly reintegrate? You know, like, for example, we have numerous examples in the Hellenistic world sure. of interaction between sacred spaces and civic bodies. Um, sure. Do you know of anything like that at this site? I don't. Um, there's nothing in the literary. There's nothing in the literary record, and it would be even more difficult to trace in the archaeological record to to connect the two. Um, so, as I was just explaining with um, with Rod's previous question, the the literary sources when it comes to trophies are very very lacking. Um, so, any sort of um, festival activities, at least specific festival activities outside of they did athletic events, they did musical events, they did this and that. There's, there's no real talk about, in detail, processions or sacrifices, um, um, let alone people who even won the events, um, which you well know um, is found in other um, major games, the Delphic Games, the Olympian Games, the Nemean Games. Um, I'm, you, I'm you just get trying to, sort of my question well, is more to like draw a connection. If they are an emulation of those earlier Greek traditions, mm -hmm. do you see any of that type of emulation um, with the reestablishment um, of, the, of the city by the Romans or the, uh, the establishment of a new city by the Romans? Exactly. So, so when it comes down to the festivals itself, there's definitely an emulation from what the ancient Greeks were doing. How that leads into the imperial cult is a little bit more difficult to trace. Um, but if you think about some of the ancient Greek games that date back to the classical period, um, they, they, they were each unique in their own sense as far as the Delphic games were very artistic and very musical. The, the, the Olympian games and the Nemean games are very athletic. And at Nicopolis, we have a hybrid of all of them. Augustus is just kind of pulling from the, the Greek world and he, he, he builds, or at least he commissions all of those structures literally right next to each other. It's the theater, it's the hippodrome, it's the gymnasium, and then on top of the hill, it's the trophy itself. So we have all of those various aspects of Greek festival, religious and athletic and music, all coming together in one sacred site at Nicopolis. I mean, they're literally a stone's throw away from one another. I'm sure Mike has a question now. Mike left, uh, left a message that said he had to go babysit. <laughs> But it was it was real nice to see Rowan in that in that picture. Rowan is so cute. Oh, he's back. Hey, Dr. Mike, do you have any questions? Yep. Hi, Rowan. Sorry about that. Rowan's been playing with my camera and microphone, so. Oh, no, it is, you are all good, bud. It's good to see him in person. <laughs> the joys of being an academic father. Um, can you say hello, Rowan? Oh. Hi, Rowan. Oh. Can you say Selway? Um, well, Selway? Um, Selwayte. <laughs> Selwayte? Oh, that's an imperative. <laughs> <laughs> no! The, imper the imperative for all. <laughs> um... So does anyone else have any questions before we finish up for the day? No?
Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I'm, I would like to thank everyone once again for coming. Um, most of you know where to contact me. So if you would like to follow up on um, any of this discussion, um, you know, please send me an email or give me a call. I will. Thank oh, I you. you. I Thanks, you everybody. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thanks very much, Rod. All right. All right take thank care. Bye-bye. Bye. Yay.